to welcome you on behalf of the PJCC board and staff. The PJCC is so proud to be able to continue to offer our signature programs, including this annual Israel Forum. At the PJCC, we believe that respecting and supporting diverse Jewish opinion, beliefs, and practices is what makes us strong and vital Jewish community. We are grateful to the Koret Foundation and the Koret Initiative on Jewish Peoplehood for their continued support of our Jewish life programming. We're also honored to present this program through the Toby Center for Jewish Peoplehood at the PJCC. We also wish to acknowledge our partners at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America, especially Bay Area Program Manager Sarah Fields for introducing us to our esteemed I guests. I don't believe as, as we end this year, when politics and polarization have been in the forefront of American minds, it is beneficial to seek understanding of the political systems for other, from other nations. The 36th government of Israel offers such insight and its diverse and surprising collaborations between right and left, religious and secular, Jews and Arabs calls for an examination deeper than Netanyahu ousted headlines. And this is where we turn to Dr. Maswa Sagiv. Dr. Maswa Sagiv is scholar in residence of the Shalom Hartman Institute based in San Francisco Bay Area and the Koret Visiting Assistant Professor of Jewish and Israel Studies at UC Berkeley. She was most recently the academic director of the Menomedine Center for Jewish and Democratic Law at Bar Ilan University Faculty of Law and an adjunct lecturer at Tel Aviv University Faculty of Law. Dr. Sagiv earned her LLB in Law and the Political Science and Political Science Magna Cum Laude from Bar Ilan University, her LLM with honors from Columbia University School of Law, and her PhD in Law from Tel Aviv University. Her research areas focus on the intersection between law, religion, gender, and state. She also works in the issues of law and social change and Jewish peoplehood. If questions arise during tonight's presentation, and I'm sure they will, please direct them in the chat to hosts and co-hosts who will present as many as we have time for, uh, for after the presentation. And now I present to you, Dr. Maswa Sagi. Thank you so much, RM. Thank you, Kimberly. I'm so happy to be here um, and have the opportunity to um, kind of see all of you, although in person would be amazing. Um, okay, one preliminary note. Um, we're two years into the pandemic, and I think that at this point, kids um, intruding into Zoom conversations are not really cute anymore. I hope we won't have that, but we might. Um, so I'm sorry in advance. Um, okay, so what I want us to do today is talk about um, Israeli current government. It's actually exactly six months since the government was, um, was voted in, um, was sworn in. And what I'd like us to do, first of all, I'm going to talk about a bit about the background of what is the political system in Israel and how our government, uh, how our governments formed. Uh, we'll talk about this two years, four elections, uh, um, um, deadlock, disaster, whatever you want to call it that Israel had. And then I want to suggest um, two interesting potentials this, uh, this government has. And after saying a few things about who won what election and how many votes did every uh, um, did every party receive? I'm not going to talk about Benjamin Netanyahu anymore. Okay, um, so I just want to show you show you for a way to start. Just one second. I'm sharing my screen. So this is. This is Israel's 36th government. Um, right here in the middle is former President Ruvi Rivlin. Over here uh, on his left is current Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. On his right is um, 
the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the alternate uh, Prime Minister, we'll talk about that soon, Yair Lapid, um, and behind him are the rest of his government. Um, this is relatively a very diverse government, uh, um, relatively speaking for Israel, for, for an, if, if comparing to the past governments. And really what I want to, 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 to tell you today, to talk about today is, um, I want to tell you two stories. And these are the heroes of these two stories. The first story is the story of these three people. So this is Yair Lapid, Naftali Bennett, and Mansour Abbas. Mansour Abbas is the head of the um, United Arab List, or Ra'am in uh, Arabic or Hebrew. Um, he has four places in the um, in the parliament, and he's a, but he's a strategic partner of this government, um, along with um, key powering Naftali Bennett, who has six between six and seven. We'll talk about that soon seats in the parliament and Yair Lapid, okay? The other hero is perhaps a bit foreign one. This is Matan Kahana. He's the minister for um, religious affairs. And he holds a crucial role in this government um, and uh, an amazing potential for me, um, uh, in my eyes. Okay, now let's talk a bit background, okay? So um, in Israel, the political, the political system of, is, of, um, is parliamentary democracy, okay? It's not a presidential democracy, it's a, parliamentary, the par a parliamental, I'm sorry, democracy. Um, so in the House, in the parliament, we have 120 members, members of the Knesset, 120 members, they are chosen through their political parties, okay? So it's not like a, it's not a, a, a dual uh, party um, institute, but a very, it's a multiple, we have multiple parties. Um, you have to, you have to gain um, enough votes in each election. You have to gain enough votes to, um, to introduce four members to the Knesset. Otherwise, if you get votes for two, for one, two or three, the whole party is not allowed in the Knesset, okay? So these votes are thrown in the garbage. So you have to have four, say, four seats in the, in the Knesset in order to, um, to be introduced as a member of the Knesset. There are 120 members. There's no direct voting for prime minister, okay? So the prime minister is the head of a party that got the most recommendations, okay? So that most of the parties are standing behind him or her and saying, this is our leader. So for example, what happens, basically what you need is 61 and over, okay? So if we have 120 um, places in the Knesset, you have to have 61, in order to form a coalition. You better get more than 61 because as you'll see, 61 is very weak. If one member of the Knesset is not around, the opposition can really embarrass you as a coalition. So we have a coalition and an opposition. The coalition has to have more than 61 members and more. So you have, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how that goes. Um, in reality, but basically what you have to do is you're voting for a party, for example, Likud, that is um, led by Benjamin Netanyahu. You are not voting for Netanyahu, you are voting for Likud. And then you pre uh, presumably, you want that who heads the party that you support would be prime minister. But in many occasions, people would vote to other parties that they um, that they that resonates with them, for example, religious parties or or the Arab Palestinian parties, and they know that the, that the people who are leading them will not be prime minister. Obviously, with four, I mean, 
A year ago, we could say, obviously, with four or five or six seats in the Knesset, you can't be prime minister. We can't say that anymore. But usually, up until now, if you only had, um, if you weren't the biggest party in the Knesset, usually up to now, the biggest party of the Knesset who led, who led the, the person who led this party was the prime minister. And if you vote for the ultra-Orthodox party, you know that the leader of this party won't be the prime minister, but you usually know who they support. You usually know that they form their alliance with um, the leader of the right, for example. That's not always the case. So basically, you vote. There was a, a short time during Israeli history that we had um, we uh, people needed to vote twice: one for prime minister and the other for the party. It caused a, a lot of problems that I I can't get into right now. But if you want to, we can do it afterwards um, during the Q and A. Um, but basically, this this is the system, and now I think. Um, when we'll see the results of the of the election for the past two years, I think I think we can be a bit more specific about what happens and how this is negotiated and 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 what happens after we have the vote. Okay, so um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. As you know, as many of you know, um, from 2019 to 2021, Israel had four election campaigns. And Israel did not have a budget authorized from 2018. Okay, so three years without a budget. Um, in one second. Okay, here it is. Okay, so in April of 2019, Israel goes to its first election. We didn't know it was the first election by then. And these are the results. I, I just, what is the background here? Okay, so for years and years, Netanyahu and the Likud, Likud and Netanyahu is the biggest party, very strong, very stable, historically who stood um, um, historically who stood uh, against or, 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 or in front of the Likud was the Labour Party and afterwards a party named Kadima. But, but during the, the past two decades or, or, or one and a half decade, the Labour Party is really weakened. I should say that the Israeli left is really weakened and what is becoming more and more strong is the Israeli center. But the Israeli center as opposed to the left and the right, it doesn't have a, a, a signature party. So you see each, almost each and every election, you see, uh, um, you see uh, a move uh, and, and, and different parties that try or, 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 um, or want, aspire to represent the Israeli center. For the past few years, I think for the past decade, Yair Lapid and Yashatid are doing quite a decent job and, and at fulfilling this position. But what happened in 2019, two parties, uh, Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid's parties were, mixed, were uh, um, joined together, decided to join together because they said, together we are stronger and we can, um, we can be, we can provide a strong opposition to Netanyahu. So they ran together, Yair Lapid, uh, although he was much more uh, time in politics than Benny Gantz, who was former um, chief of staff, no, uh, a chief of Ramatkal. How do you say? Okay, you're muted, so you can't help me. That's a problem. But he led the Israeli army and then came into politics. So Yair Lapid, um, with an act that we'll see again later on, said, okay, we think the, the surveys tell us, and you think that you will be a better face to this change, you will be heading this new party called Kacholavan Blue and White. In April 2019, Kacholavan receives 35 seats in the Knesset, and Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud receives 35 seats at the, at the Knesset. 
A few interesting things to notice. Do you see this zero here? Uh, Hayamina Hadash gets zero seats in the Knesset. Who led, the, the person who led Hayamina Hadash in 2019 is Naftali Bennett, the same Naftali Bennett who's prime minister now. Okay, another, uh, several interesting um, numbers here. Um, Shas and UJT are the ultra orthodox parties. Um, Hadash Ta'al and um, Balad and United Arab um, and the United Arab uh, Party are running separately. These are the Arab parties. They are running separately. They are getting a total of ten of ten seats at the Knesset. Labor, the historical Labor, gets six places. Israel Beitenu, uh, which largely represents um, former Soviet Union um, immigrants to Israel gets five votes. Um, this Israel Beitenu for the past three years is a strong opposition to Netanyahu, although it is located on the right um, ideologically. And then this is, this is Kulanu, this is a party, it's not, it doesn't exist anymore. It's kind of a kind of a Likud, kind of right-wing uh, secular party, um, not with us anymore. Meretz, the, the hardcore left party, gets only four, four seats at the Knesset. So the Israeli left has a total of 10 seats, like the real Israeli left. Center gets a lot of seats. What happens when, I, I will stop sharing for a minute. What happens after we get the votes? After we get the votes, um, according to the according to the basic law, which is like a constitution um, in Israel, according to the constitutional order, what happens is all of the parties have to send representatives to the president of the state, where they have to recommend who they think could form a government, who they think could be prime minister. Okay, so after. After the, uh, the different parties recommend the, to the president who should be a prime minister, the president decides who he is giving the mandate to form the government and to form the coalition. This person has a month and then, but it can be, it can be, um, it can be longer. He has about a month and a half to form a government. If he can't do that, the mandate goes to the second in line, okay, that got the second uh, amount of recommendations. And if after a month and a half, even he still doesn't, is not able to form a government, the mandate goes to the Knesset, okay, goes to the parliament. Whoever, uh, member, uh, member of the Knesset who gets 60 signatures can be prime minister, 60, 60 signatures of members of the Knesset can be the prime minister. Okay, what happened in April, 2019? In April, 2019, we have 35, 35, um, but it was a deadlock. Okay, so Benjamin Netanyahu uh, got the mandate because he got more recommendations uh, from the president, but he couldn't form a government instead of going to the president and saying, I couldn't form the government, let Benny Gantz try. He actually promoted a dissolution of the Knesset, okay? So he promotes a law that dissolutes the Knesset because he doesn't want to pass the mandate to Gantz in the chance that he can form a government. Okay, moving on, another election. Second election happens in September, 2019. In September 2019, Blue and White gets 33 sit seats. Likud gets 31. The Arab parties run together as a joint list, as a joint party. They get 13 seats. That's a lot. Okay. Um, Shas and UTJ, UTJ, which are the ultra orthodox parties, get the same, they, they usually get the same votes, the, the same amount of seats. 
um, every Knesset. Yamina, okay, so you, you see Yamina here with nine, with seven votes. What happened is another merger between Hayamina Hadash of Naftali Bennett, who did not pass in the former um, election, and a right-wing um, religious unity, um, very right-wing religious unity party. They run together, they get seven seats. What happens, um, another deadlock, still can't form a government. Now we have Netanyahu tries to form a government, can't do it, returns the mandate, Gantz tries, can't do it, returns the mandate, another election. The other election, yes, it's election day. It's, it's, it's at some point it, it felt so ridiculous. We had another election. Okay, March, 2020. Okay, now you have to understand that all the while we still have COVID to deal with all the while through this whole um, escapade. Okay, March, 2020. Um, Likud gets 36, Kahol Avan gets 33. The joint list is up to 15, which is crazy. And we'll talk soon about what that means. Labor and Meretz are running together because there is a real danger that they're gonna, one of them is gonna be canceled um, completely. They run together, they get seven. So the Israeli left is at seven seats in this uh, very short Knesset. Um, so that's the map. Israel Beiteno, as I told you, is not going with the, with the right, but it's not going with the left either. So what happens then? Benny Gantz receives more recommendation to the president. He gets 61 because the joint list is, most of it, is recommending on him to be, um, to, to form the government. Um, but he fails. He fails because two members of his own party are saying we are not willing to sit with the Arab party, with this Arab party, with the joint list. So they're not willing. The joint list is also very hesitant. Are we, will we back the government from the outside? Will we not be, it's not, it didn't even get to the real point of, of something happening. Um, because again, these two members of Kocholavan are saying, no way, I'm not doing it. So, so what happens at the last minute after Gantz returns the mandate to the president and says, I failed, Netanyahu and Gantz, because of COVID, are saying, you know what? We're forming a government together. They're calling it a unity, but an, they're calling it more than a unity, an alternation government where Netanyahu will be prime minister for a year and then Gantz will be prime minister for two years and then Netanyahu will, all, will end up being prime minister for the last year, okay? Um, but then something happens and I'm not gonna interpret politics here, but I'm just gonna tell you the information. What happens is that one of the things that a government has to do is pass a budget. If it doesn't pass a budget, it's dissoluted. Okay, so we go to election. Um, this government did not pass a bus. Did not pass a budget. Um, the reality is that Netanyahu ref refused to pass the budget, and um, after about nine months of him being prime minister, going to election one, once again, um, third time's a charm. Not really. Um, now, the last election, March 2021. So this is also an interesting, this is right after the voting, um, right, right after the results came. So this is also a very interesting way of drawing, you know, it's also very interesting how you choose to draw the blocks of government. So what happened here is the Likud gets 30 mandates, that's a lot. Okay, I forgot to tell you that something happened here. Once Benny Gantz decided to go with Netanyahu, Kahol Avan is really, um, is, uh, um, get separated, 
okay? Because Kahol Avan, um, Yair Lapid says, no way I'm sitting with Benjamin Netanyahu. I promised I won't sit with him. It's against my morals. It's against my promises. And they uh, go their separate ways. So now we have a very small Kahol Avan, blue and white, and a much larger Yesh Atid. So Yesh Atid gets 17, Kahol Levan, blue and white gate gets eight, Israel Beitenu seven, labor goes up to seven. I'll go there soon. Likud gets 30. These are the two ultra-Orthodox parties. This is the, the religious Zionism is the, the very extreme right that uh, one of the Kahana movement members are in this party. It's, a, it's very extreme right. It gets six mandates, which is a lot, six seats in the Knesset. Um, the Likud works really hard for this party to pass and get enough seats in the Knesset because it works good for them. They don't, they don't want to end up without um, enough supporters. Meretz gets six. That's also good um, comparatively. Um, and then the joint list, the joint Arab list gets six, but it's not, not everyone are running with the joint list because the joint list got separated to the joint list and the United Arab list. Ram, remember the hero of our story, Mansour Abbas, leading Ram says from the get go, I'm, interesting, I'm interested in something new right now. I'm interested in changing the, play, the, the playing field. I'm running alone. It was really doubtful whether he could obtain four seats. Just remember, if he gets even three and a half seats, he's out. He's not getting inside. So he runs. He gets four seats. Yamina, only Naftali Bennett right now. Okay, Naftali Bennett, Ayelet Chaked. Um, this is a very, it's a religious, but very like, I don't want to say winking to the secular, but it's kind of, it kind of is. So it's, it's, it's somewhere in between the secular and the modern religious who is kind of conservative. We'll talk about that soon more. And from the get go, not only Israel Beitenu is saying, I'm not going to sit with Netanyahu, but Yamina Naftali Bennett criticizes Netanyahu for his performance in COVID, for his performance against um, different enemies. Um, so he's also very straightforward about not sitting with Netanyahu. And another party is formed, a new party of uh, people who left the Likud. Um, led by Gidon Sal. This is a party called New Hope, A New Hope. Um, it said from the get-go, I'm with the blog that wants to replace Netanyahu, um, very, um, trying to be very, um, like uh, getting its inspiration from uh, former Prime Minister Begin. So the secular right, very uh, respectful toward the, judi the judicial system um, and very critical towards Netanyahu. Okay, so this is the block. This is this is the picture of what of, of of the results after the vote. But what happened eventually is that Netanyahu got not enough recommendations, but the more the most recommendations. He tried to form a government. He couldn't do it because New Hope, Yamina, Israel Beitenu wouldn't join him. He negotiated, seriously negotiated, with Ram, with the United Arab List, with Mansour Abbas. He seriously negotiated with him. And perhaps ironically, he opened the door for other, um, for other parties to negotiate and um, include them in the new government. Um, after that, Yair Lapid gets the mandate. At the last few days of the mandate, uh, that it's in the hands of Yair Lapid, the May war Shomer Chomot is starting. 
they are postponing all the negotiations. They were in real negotiations with Mansour Abbas, who is conflicted right now because he sees the May war and he doesn't really know what to do when he's in negotiations to be a part of this new government. They're um, freezing all negotiations, but then a few days after Shomer Chomot, in the last day before the mandate returns to the president, Yair Lapid um, um, declares, I have a government. But what kind of government do I have? I have a government in which I'm not prime minister first. Naftali Bennett, with seven seats in the Knesset, gets to be prime minister. So a lot of criticism about an anti-democratic move of, um, of placing someone who's really, I mean, no one thought he's going to be prime minister because he, it was clear he'll have a, sh a, a, a small amount of votes. So no one thought he's going to be prime minister and he's prime minister now. And Yair Lapid says, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. And the important part in Israeli democracy, in any parliamentary um, democracy, sorry, <coughs> is again, not who's the largest party, clearly the Likud, is who succeeds in maintaining 61 votes. So it's just, you know, it's adding the figures and negotiating and reaching this 61. Another um, surprise Bennett got was one of his party members, Amichai Shikli, um, which who was um, a personal nomination of Bennett because it's not, uh, Yamina is not a primaries um, kind of party. A lot of the parties in Israel are not um, are not decided according to primaries. So uh, this person, this member of the Knesset said, no, nope, that's against my mor moral. Um, at some point, Naftali Bennett declared he's not going to sit with Yair Lapid and with the Arabs. Um, so he's not voting with the government. He's even voting against the government in some very crucial votes and right now he's not even a member of, of this party of, of Yamina. So it's seriously in 61, which is a very fragile government. It's really hard to, um, to, um, to, to, to conduct yourself as a government um, in this situation. Okay, um, this government had quite a few challenges along the way. Um, so three weeks after the government is formed, uh, the first challenge is um, they need to extend a law of um, a family re reunification law. Maybe we'll have more time to talk about it in the uh, Q and A. They need to put, they need to um, extend it. They fail. Okay, so at the last minute, they didn't know that Amichai Shikli is going to vote against them. They failed, failed at the last minute. It was 59-59, and they couldn't, and they couldn't um, pass this vote. Everyone thought, not everyone, a lot of people thought this government is not going to make it. It's just, it's days are counted, and it's not going to happen. But, um, but it, it came up. It came across a few challenges, and and it's we are six months after, and and it's still here. Um, another huge challenge was passing the budget. So in November last month, this government managed to uh, pass a budget. It's the first time I have to show you this. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So this is Avigdor Lieberman, who's uh, head of the Israel Beitenu. And I'll translate for you. Okay, so this is the the budget of of twenty twenty one and also twenty to twenty two uh, afterwards. The budget passes, and he's saying the last time that a budget passed in Israel, France won the World Cup, Spotify got uh, started to uh, be accessible in Israel, Neta Barzilai won the Euro Eurovision, 
we still didn't had COVID and Harry and Meghan just got married. So it's crazy to think how long Israel was conducting itself without a budget. It's really crazy. Three years, three years without, without a budget is crazy for every, every, every government. Okay. Um, so they withstood those challenges. Um, and what I want to um, talk about now is talk about the unique character of this government and perhaps um, two interesting uh, potentials it holds, okay? So the first potential is in matters of state and religion, okay? So I told you before, Matan Kahana is the Minister for Religious Affairs. He's uh, a um, religious Zionist. He was, um, he served in the army in one of the best units, uh, uh, an elite unit, Sayeret Matkal. And then on the day that he was supposed to um, be released from, the, released from the army, he enlisted again and went to um, um, flight, flight course, be, be a, 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 a combat pilot. Okay, so he went back to the, to the army. He's, uh, he's a combat pilot, very ideological. Um, his military background is very prominent in everything he does. And at the same time, his religious background is very prominent at everything he does. Um, he's a very interesting figure because he keeps presenting himself as conservative. Okay, he's, he would say everywhere in every interview to other MKs and his speeches, he's saying, I'm conservative, I'm a conservative, I'm an halachic Orthodox Jew and no way of, 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 of uh, going beyond the borders of the halacha, uh, not on my watch. But at the same time, he is making, he is promoting reforms in the, in religious services, in state and religion that have not been seen forever, okay, in Israel. So a reform about kashrut, um, really taking a lot of power from the um, Israeli rabbinate. He's talking about opening a, um, he's talking about opening a, uh, program for women to be um, to be able to go and take the exact same exams that, may, that men go in the rabbinate, okay? So it's like the rabbinate exams, but for women, they won't be ordinated, they won't be ordained to be rabbis, but they will have recognition on their knowledge and their proficiency. And why does that matter? It matters to jobs, okay? Because state, they have a lot in Israel, we have a lot of state jobs for religious um, persons, for religious leaders. So that means a lot. Um, he's talking, he's promoting right now a very meaningful reform about conversion. He talked very seriously about promoting mitveh um, kotel, the the arrangement of the kotel. Um, in the past couple of days, it got stuck. Maybe we'll have the chance to talk about it more. But he's promoting. He's he's talking conservative, but he's doing. I don't want to say liberal, but he's doing a lot more than was ever done in Israel in state and religion. We'll analyze that more in a second. The second potential is the potential of the Jewish-Arab partnership. Okay, so Ram, the, the uh, Mansour Abbas's party is an equal partner in this government. Mansour Abbas is the deputy minister of Arab affairs. Um, another member of his party, Walid Taha, is chair of internal affairs committee. This is a really important committee of the Knesset. Um, and Abbas makes a decision to participate, to actively participate in leading the state of Israel, not just the Arab uh, Palestinian communities in Israel, 
or the, the, the population, the Arab population in Israel, but to be a part of leading all of Israel. This is a complete opposite than the ideology of the joint list that says, I am not actively participating. I would always be on the outside. I will try to, um, to help my constituents, but I won't be actively insider. Um, he's also making a decision um, to be more focused on Arab Israeli citizens than on the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Um, this is also an active. Um, this is also an active decision. I want to show you something else. This is the last thing I'll show you. Um, okay, this is just by the way. This is Matan Kahana meeting with Rabbi Druckmann, who's the oldest uh, religious Zionist rabbi, very conservative. So he really plays on both fields here, both in the modern Orthodox and the um, and the really well non-modern, non-modern Orthodox, like the religious Zionists. I know I'm talking only about your Orthodox. We can definitely focus on that more um, during the Q&A. I realize that I'm talking only about your Orthodox here, but this is Mansour Abbas, okay? So I want you to look closely on these two, two tweets, okay? So this is Mansour Abbas um, presenting the economic plan um, the, the five-year governmental economic plan for the Arab population in Israel. It's called, it has a name, it's called Takdum, Hitkadmut in Hebrew, or Takdum is uh, in Arabic, Hitkadmut in Hebrew, or um, moving forward, okay? It means moving forward. Um, this is Suleiman, Mas Ma uh, Suleiman Maswada, is uh, a journalist who's, um, who's, who's saying here, that Abbas is choosing to place the flag of Israel in the frame. It doesn't happen in the Knesset, okay? It's not in the parliament. It's in the Arab city of Kfar Qasim. And he chooses to, to place the flag of Israel here. He chooses to put this exact photo in his Arab tweet, Arabic tweet. This is not inconsequential, okay? So this is very important. And then this is his tweet in Hebrew. And what he says here is that the times when we were another number uh, without influence and meaning and, and meaning in the Israeli politics, these times are over. The, the times that our plans, the plans that were that were dedicated to the Arab population in Israel, the times that this plans were these plans were just like had this number, serial number, uh, random serial numbers, these days are over. Our plan now has a name, has a meaning. Takdum. Takdum means the uh, he says the name symbolizes the change that Ra'am brings to the Israeli society and specifically the Arab society. And then he says, and to those of you who are trying to, um, to uh, like put uh, sticks in our wheels, move forward, move forward. It's not gonna happen. Um, so maybe, um, maybe a few reflections about these two potentials, okay? A few reflections and then, and then I'll open um, the floor for questions. So um, the dilemma for the Arab population in Israel, the Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel, the dilemma whether to participate or to um, boycott and criticize is a real dilemma here. It's a real dilemma whether to be an outsider or an insider. And it's a dilemma both um, a moral dilemma and uh, a political and social dilemma, a cultural dilemma. Um, what do you, what message do you give to your constituents? Are you led by them or, or are you leading them? And Mansour Abbas decides that boycott is only aiding extremists and dialogue and participation is really hard. It's really uncomfortable. You have to understand that this government, it has in it like the most extreme left and the very like strong right in it, okay? It's also interesting to note 
that in the negotiations to this government, no one is happy. This is not the case in former governments. It's interesting. In former governments, the parties were more or less really, you know, they were content. Here, no one is happy, but they are willing to sit together and work together for the Israeli, for the Israeli society. And Mansour Abbas says, dialogue is really hard to talk with Naftali Bennett and Ayala Chaked and Gidon Saar, who are really ideological right. It's not easy. But you know what? It also enables me to put a mirror in front of them. And that can only happen when we're in a dialogue. They're not really listening when I'm boycotting them. They're not really listening when I'm on the outside. I'm part of them now. We are partners. We are partners in leading this um, government, in leading this society, in leading this state. So this is one. Abbas's move did something else. It broke the perception of homogeneous that the Arab society is, um, um, the, the Arab society is perceived very homogeneous in Israeli society. It's like, it's the Arabs. So the Arab society has religious fractions and secular and liberals and conservative like every other society in every other place. When Mansour Abbas says, I'm going inside the government, he's saying, we are a diverse society. We are a diverse society and it also helps in, 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 in mitigating the otherness of the Arab society and population in Israel. I should also note, note that the Arab party, Ra'am, Ab Abbas's party, is the religious Arab party. It's a religious conservative party. It's really important to note, okay? They're not really left. Um, and another thing, you know what? So the uh, in 2018, the, the basic law, Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people passes, the nation state law. And one of the researches that was done afterwards, uh, researchers, um, Barak Horen, Gidron, and Feldman, they found something really interesting. They found that the minority, the Arab population in Israel, um, the, the law doesn't change rights. The actual rights, it's, it's like a preamble of a constitution. So it doesn't change actual rights, but it has an expressive meaning. And they found that this expressive meaning caused the minority, the Arab minority to perceive it, the law, as influencing their legal status in three um, areas, in housing, in hiring, and in voting. I don't know if you know the basic law. It doesn't talk about any of these. It doesn't talk about voting, that's for sure, but still it was perceived because of this, its expressiveness. It was perceived as harming the, the legal status of the Arab minority in Israel. Abbas's partnership, does the exact opposite. It has an expressive meaning. And this expressive meaning is, is, is reflected both, uh, is, 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 um, is done towards both the Israeli, the Jewish Israeli public and the Arab Israeli public. Um, it results in willingness to integrate in uh, the opposite of, of, of alienation, okay? So wanting to be more part of of, uh, of, of this society, of this state. Now, just, uh, ju just to finish my, my, um, my, my talk, um, my, this, this stage of, of, of our talk, I know that what I told you so far, when we talk about dynamics of change, this is not revolution, okay? Nothing I talked about so far means radical change in Israel, not in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, not in state and religion, not in the inner relationship of Israel, of, 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 uh, of, of, of inner Israeli relationship between um, citizens. None, none of it is radical. None of it is an extreme reform. I don't think it is a coincidence that the persons who are 
succeeding in leading this are um, two religious parties that are conceived as conservative. I think that the public in Israel, they, it is possible to understand and react to gradual change. It would be much harder to understand and, and, and receive radical change. And perhaps I'll stop here and, and maybe we'll have the chance to talk more about it um, later on, but I'll, I think I'll stop now. Thank you so much. You cannot see everybody's screens because they are off, but I know we are all clapping for you and really showing our deep appreciation. I see Burns' uh, laptop, they're, they're clapping for everybody right now. So thanks for having your camera on. Um, we did get a couple questions coming in. So I'm gonna go through those. So if I'm looking there and talking to you, but I'll help get those to you. Um, my comment is, if anybody um, was looking for a show recommendation, you made this as exciting as Borgen on Netflix. So what you have done for Israeli politics is what they have done for Danish politics. And I think you should write the spinoff because it was like watching an episode. It was wonderful. Um, I did have one question. Um, when you had that budget that did not change or get approved for three years here, you might know it's like government shutdown, government shutdown, the government will shut down. There's not a budget passed. And I'm wondering, did they just default to the older budget or what did they do? To, that's what they did. You just the last budget. But that's not. So what happens is that everyone gets one twelfth. How do you say one 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 of twelfth month? Uh, they get the uh, relative budget budget. Everyone gets it. But it's so hard because you can't start anything new, the local, um, local authorities are collapsing, literally collapsing. You can't, not doing any reform and any change for three years is unbelievable. And think that this all, this is happening through a pandemic. So that's not, I mean, that's not ideal. That's horrible. Um, so there's a new book now by the journalist Barak Ravid. I don't know if you've seen some of the, some of the um, headlines about Trump saying about Netanyahu um, F him. So one of the things that he says in this book is that um, Netanyahu said that he cannot, um, he cannot prepare for a strike in Iran because he has no budget and it's a new item. So some of the, I don't know how much this is true or not, but the thing is, it is so hard. Most of the activities are, a lot of the activities are being done at the level of, of, local, of, of local authorities, of local towns. And, without, and they were very close to collapsing. So it's not a complete collapse um, of everything, but it was, it was horrible. It was a horrible time. Thank you. I was, I was just curious about that because it, it does seem like that's a good reason that they must have to do that. That's an imperative for a government. So I'm going to ask John's question now. John says, how do you explain why the Arab Israelis and anti-occupation MKs are getting further settlement expansion or letting, sorry, further settlement expansion occur? Is this just because the goal of keeping Netanyahu out of power is more important or are there other issues at play? So this is a really good question. And I think this is a question that shed light not only on this specific question, but on a lot of questions. How can you understand Meretz, the really left party, um, voting for the family unification um, law that prohibits, um, that prohibits basically if, uh, a citizen uh, marries a non-citizen, they can naturalize the, the married spouse and, um, and they become citizens, but only if you're a Jew, okay? Not if you're an Arab. It was inconceivable that Meretz and the two members of Ram voted for this law. And it's almost inconceivable that, um, that as you said, they vote for the, um, for the expandment of, of, of settlements. So to be, I can be cynical and say it's, it's just to uh, keep Netanyahu out of, 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 uh, of leadership. But I, I really don't think that's the case. I think that 
there is a deep understanding within the members of this um, of this government that they would have to compromise because you know what? We won't get our ideal partners because they are not, I mean, they don't have the power. And since we cannot change our people, that's what we have. That's the, ref the exact reflection of the Israeli society. So this is what we have. We have two choices. We can be irrelevant in the everyday life of our citizens. We can be irrelevant. And then we can be really purist. And we can be, um, we'll be, uh, we won't be blind to the suffering of our people. And we will be very uh, um, clean, morally and ethically. But you know what? We'll be irrelevant because they don't really need us. And this understanding, it's not only Abbas and his, um, and his party. It's not only Abbas. It's, the, it's I think it, it's actually all of them. All of them are, so there's an expression in Hebrew, swallowing, swallowing frogs. I don't know if it, if it translates. It doesn't translate well, right? So, okay. So everyone in this government had to compromise. Sounds like an Egyptian plague. I think we're so in now. I'm, now I'm really interesting, and in, I'm really interested in the source of this expression. But everyone had to compromise so much on not just on you know like funds, but on their values, on their ideology. But and they did that in order to be part you to lead, just to lead in order to lead the. Israeli society and the Israeli state, they had made some serious compromises. Will there be a point where there would be a red line and they would say, well, th that's it? I'm sure there are red lines. I'm sure the red lines are moving um, all the time. Um, it's, not, it's not easy in our environment, when and when I'm saying our environment, I mean the world right now, it's not easy to be um, complex. It's not easy to be um, nuanced. It's much easier, it's much more satisfying to be a purist. Um, and they decided not to be. And uh, I mean, I understand the complexity, I understand the criticism, I personally applaud them for, for doing that. And they are, by the way, uh, paying a personal price every day of threats and um, very loud demonstrations outside their homes and cursing their kids and, and whatnot. Um, but that's, you know, that's our world right now. We have a lot of questions that are about um, the different parties. And we, I think a lot of people want you to prophesize on what might happen in the future. Um, there's a lot of interest in that. So do your best. But um, it's what Dan is asking, um, clearly the government led by Bennett worries that it will lose a seat of existing um, MP defects to Netanyahu. However, are there any MPs in Likud or other parties that might defect to the current government? So this is a really interesting question. So there are a lot of speculations for years now um, about, so basically you have in, in the Likud and in the right, you have um, old fashioned um, right wing liberals and populists. Um, the growing power in the Likud right now is the populist but you still have a very large core of the old school liberal conservatives, but secular liberal conservatives or traditional secular conservatives in the Likud. So some of them left the Likud and, um, and established the new hope, Gidon Saar as their leader. He, was, he tried to compete uh, against Netanyahu in the primaries approximately two or I, I think it was two years ago, I, I don't remember accurately, and he really lost. He was like, it, it was a really, it, it wasn't even close. Um, so as an Israeli, I, I can share with you personally, okay? So as an Israeli, it's not easy 
to see um, and to understand that a lot of my people um, is um, very swayed by populism. Um, but I think that a lot of people are keeping quiet, but if this government persists, um, more and more people would um, would break the silence is not a good um, term here, but breaks the but but break the silence. Thank you. I always um and and thank you. I'm just thanking the audience here tonight because I always we always tell speakers that you're going to want to speak for us and I, we have an intelligent, engaged audience. And they're going to ask great questions and you are not letting me down. You are filling the inbox with some good questions. So here's another one along similar lines, just different party. Um, Alan asks us to comment, please, on how there are no ultra orthodox parties in the government and is that likely to change during the four years, assuming the governments continue when alternate PM takes over. Wonderful, wonderful question. So all the while, um, okay, so historically, ultra-Orthodox parties went not once and not twice with the left or center-left, okay? Ultra-Orthodox party, uh, the ultra-Orthodox um, public in Israel has become more and more right-wing and more and more core Zionist as opposed to what it, again, historically uh, have been um, in, in the first decades of, of Israel. But the ultra-Orthodox parties were very sought after by Benny Gantz in his many trials um, to form a government and, um, and also in this government. One or two big obstacles for that. The first one is Yair Lapid, who is one of the um, architects, uh, if you will, of this government. So Yair Lapid, is painted as anti-religious. He's not anti-religious at all. He's painted as anti-religious um, because he's really, he wants to uh, enlist all ultra-Orthodox to the party or most of ultra-Orthodox to, to, the, to the army, sorry, to the army. And he wants um, the ultra-Orthodox to be part of the work, um, of, of, of the work market. Um, and he's, um, it would be very challenging for the ultra-Orthodox parties to sit in his government. That's a first. Um, I should also say that right now, very interesting stuff is happening between the, the, the religious Zionists and the ultra-Orthodox. So Matan Kahana has a lot of clashes with the ultra-Orthodox parties right now. Um, with everything he does, he's, He's really taking a lot of power and jobs from the ultra-Orthodox public and the ultra-Orthodox leaders right now. The second challenge is these uh, parties were, um, have kind of sworn loyalty to Netanyahu, like basically like signing a form that says that they are loyal to Netanyahu and the Likud, specifically to Netanyahu and the Likud. Um, I think that a lot of uh, people in the government still think that it can happen. Um, in the last two, 30 years, um, the ultra-Orthodox parties never been outside of the government for too long because um, because it's an, it's, it's, an, it's an important asset for, for a minority to be part of the government. Um, so that's, that's going to be interesting. I, I cannot, um, I, I, I cannot predict what will happen. We won't hold you to it, but thank you for trying. That was really good. Um, I think you're hinting a little ar around the threads of this question. Barry asked a great question. Uh, given how precarious this government remains, it reminds me of a question we asked here too. What do you most fear could bring it down? A war in Gaza mm. or in mixed cities. If on the one hand, the fact that these negotiations happened during the May war and that the government actually um, 
actually succeeded afterwards is unbelievable to me. Um, I think I think if there would be another um, clash, it's it's it, it can be really dangerous. I also think another um, this is maybe a bit funny, but I think another big challenge would be um, the nomination of justices to the Supreme Court, which was postponed once already. Um, the The judicial system is a uh, is a huge issue in Israel. But you know what? This government is also it's it's working really smart because I mean I'll give you uh, I wanted to say that and you didn't ask so I'll say it um, <laughs> I'll just jump on your question and I'll say it. But um, so in the in, in the past, in, in November Matan Kahana was given an interview about the Kotel and he said that we have to re uh, revive the the settlement um, that was canceled by two years ago to, um, we, we have to sort this out. We have to solve this and to give recognition to the liberal, um, to the liberal um, um, uh, streams, the reform and conservative um, stream, we have, we have to give them um, the recogni the, their recognition. And he was very passionate about it. And then three days ago, um, he said he's dropping it. And Bennett says he's dropping it because it's too hard and it's utilized as a weapon against this government. Um, and, and, and something that is, is they, they sensed, it's, they're, they're getting criticism and demonstrations and everything all the time, but they sensed that this one, um, no, he's not, no. Um, and, and Matan Kahana is not related to Mayor Kahana, by the way. Okay, so it's just like a different um, name. Um, they sensed that this is one too many for now. So personally, I can say I'm very frustrated by this result because I, I was really looking forward, although I don't think the, 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 the settlement they reached beforehand was good. And I don't think it's, it's good for the status of Orthodox women in Israel. I think they, could, they, they need to continue struggle in the Western wall itself, but they are acting smartly. And they know if you have the, so there's an interesting, um, there's an interesting theory in, 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 in thinking about theories of change, of, 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 of dynamics of change. So basically you have two strategies for change. So one of them is evolution and the other is revolution, okay? So the evolution is working from within the existing framework, whether it's social, legal, religious, whatever. So they're working within the existing framework, religious framework, but a religious and political framework and social framework, but they're always like pushing the boundaries and they always think we need to push them, but we need not to break them. So it's a constant nego negotiation on what we're doing and what we're giving up. And it can be very frustrating, but I, I'll just, well, first of all, I'm, I'm an evolution kind of person. And I know that many are, are you know, feel free to, um, to not agree with me, but um, I see things that were not seen in Israel for so long, so long. So this is, this is for me, is so hopeful. Um, I, I can't even express how. Um, our board president, Bill Strauss, has a question. So thanks, Bill. Um, what is the political impact of Bennett's visit to the UAE? Um, I think it's still early to say I, the picture, uh, the photograph there was so, was amazing because you see a photograph of a religious Jew with, uh, with uh, uh, UAE's um, 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 leader, um, which is amazing. I think that mostly the Abraham Accords are still, um, um, are still written to the, they are still Netanyahu's and Trump's, 
So they're not Bennett's. And in a way, he's he's just continuing and just don't destroy them. But he's not really getting the political credit for them. Um, I think and I think it's fair. Again, again, the 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 journalist who wrote this book, Barak Ravid, is a very uh, very critical of Netanyahu, and still he emphasizes um, his and Trump's role in the Abraham Accords. Um, so I, I'm not sure it has a political gain yet. Thank you. Will you humor us with like one or two more questions? I know I'm just peppering you with questions, but they're still coming. No, I'm in. having a blast okay? here. So okay, good. Really. <laughs> You're doing an amazing job. I just Carry on. I'm here. having fun. Not wearing you down. Uh, we had a couple questions come in about the wall. So we're going to just combine those. And um, we're hoping that maybe question is, could you expand on what happened with the agreement on the wall and what the prospects are in the near future? The wall, the separation wall, the Western wall? Well, ah, that's interesting. We have two different questions. <laughs> Some reference the wall. Talk about every wall. Thank you. I think that's interesting because then we have another one about the Kotal. So, so, um, oh. So uh, we have a couple questions and they're not specific. I had assumed one, well, but but feel free to take it the way you like. And uh, Alan, if you have a, if you want to weigh in, let me know. So Let's first see. of all, I think very interestingly, I haven't mentioned that this before, two members of the Knesset are conservative and reform. So Gilad Kariv, the reform rabbi who was uh, leading the reform movement in Israel is part of the labor um, party, and he's now leading, the, he's the chair of the um, Constitution, Law, and Justice Committee in the Knesset, one of the most important committees of the Knesset he leads, okay? That's a first. Um, the second uh, one is Alon Tal, who's a, conser who's, who's, um, um, a conservative um, um, leader in Israel, and he's in blue and white. This is not, again, this is not inconsequential. Um, and I think it was two months ago, okay, so three months ago, Gilad Kariv used his immunity to bring to the Kotel a Torah scroll, scroll, sorry, for four women of the wall to read in it, because I don't know if you're uh, aware of it, but women of the wall cannot bring their own Torah scroll into the Kotel and, then, and they cannot use the existing um, Torah scrolls that are inside the Kotel. So he used this immunity um, and he brought one to the Kotel. Um, it was a very powerful moment, um, very emotional, very, um, for, for better and worse, okay? And right now the situation of the Kotel is actually, it, 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 it's pretty horrible because what happens is, so. The, 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 the liberal streams still have Robinson arcs, okay? So it's the continuation of the, of the Kotel and they have uh, a very small space there, but they have a small space there and they can pray there. But what happens uh, since July, every Rosh Chodesh, every beginning of the month, some extreme religious, um, some extreme religious um, groups arrive to this, um, this Kivsat Harash, this, um, this, this small place of worship, Robinson's Ark, and, um, and erecting a separation, you know, like the Mechitza, and they're, they're not giving any chance to the women of the wall to pray there. So they, usually they start the Robinson Ark and then go to the uh, Western Wall to pray there, the women of the wall. Um, Gilad Kariv brought the Torah scroll, a month afterwards, and, and listen, this was crazy, okay? So a month afterwards, um, Arya Deri, who leads Shas, is calling on all of the, I don't know, the public um, to come to the Kotel on Rosh Chodesh and protest again, against the desecration of our religion. And former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu retweets this, okay? He retweets um, this call for, for action of Arya Deri, and then President Herzog is calling Gilad Kariv and he's begging him, please don't go to the Kotel, don't bring the Torah scroll. Uh, we have to have, like, peace and quiet, be the mature, 
be the, the adult in, 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 this, in this story. And Gilad Kariv agrees. And, and he didn't come. And, and they canceled the huge protest. Um, but what happens, right? It's not good what's happening now. And I know that a lot of people in the government feels it. They feel it. And I don't think that they would give it up. But right now, it's too much for them. Right now, they want... They actually wanted to promote it now. It's so that I'm I'm still mourning mourning the the, the this this development from the past uh, couple of days. Um, now about the separation wall, and and it's not, it's not an issue now, but I'm I'm using it to to say something more. So this government was formed under the agreement to not um, to not deal with extreme contro controversies and to really try to focus on life them like life itself um health education economy and not really going on not try not going uh, and 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 uh, either solving or worsening the israeli palestinian conflict for example i do notice though it's not really happening they are um, dealing with controversies. They're just doing it while presenting themselves as conservatives and doing a bit, like a bit outside the box, a bit stretching um, of the boundaries that I told you before. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you for touching on both walls. I appreciate it. Um, okay, here's our cynical question from the group. We'll get your honest opinion on this assessment. If the current government miraculously survives, do you truly think Bennett will let Lapid become prime minister as previously negotiated? Lapid? Um, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, it's set. It's happening. Okay. You heard it there, John. It's happening. <laughs> no. So, okay. So, listen, a lot of things can happen. Um, I don't want to see this recording a year from now. No, but I really think if you're asking me now, okay, now I'm going to be a lawyer. Okay. So, if you're asking me right now, the, 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 the consciousness of the members of the Knesset right now is a consciousness of cooperation. So this question is, first of all, not cynical. The, the, the not cynical answer is yes, because they are committed to one another. The cynical answer is if he won't let Lapid be prime minister, at least one third of, I don't know if a quarter of the of this government is not going to be reelected. Okay, so right now, according to the surveys, um, Bennett's situation, New Hope situation is not really good. He kind of right now, Bennett burned himself um, to the right, to the like to the to to some of the right, not all of them, but some of the of the of the. Um, like classic right, he's burned. Now, and, and the center left doesn't need another Yair Lapid. He can just vote for Yair Lapid. So he doesn't need another, you know, another center party. So they also have a cynical interest to keep the government going and, and keep, you know, ruling. And I also think that the, the, the left, uh, the leftist parties were not part of the government for a long time. I think it's not, it's not as, it's not like the, I know that power is, um, is intoxicating, but I'm not talking about this now. I think that the feeling that you are actually relevant and that you, that you are actually influential, I think it won't be easy to give that up. And, and for that, you need a government going, even though Lapid is prime minister. And right now they're, they're dealing, they're, they're, they're going on really well together. Lapid and Bennett. We, we love it. Just cooperation is a new word here. So we're, we're excited that it's going well. Go and now, now in a month from now, something would happen. And then you'll, you'll all we say, oh, what did she talk about? We, we, we won't do that to you at all. I'm going to close tonight um, with uh, Fred. Oh, thank you, Fred. Um, Fred Wenner, our interim CEO, has a great question because it's about continuing education. So I think it's a nice place to end. Um, wants to know what is the best English language periodical for us to read to know more about politics and government activities in Israel? 
It's a good question. Um, don't read Haaretz on its own. If you're, if you're reading Haaretz, read another one with it um, because it's not accurate enough. The, I think the Jerusalem Post is doing a fairly decent job. Um, I would love it if, you'd, if you would have both Haaretz and Makor Rishon together, it would be perfect. But I don't think Makor Rishon has an English version. I'm not sure. But they, two of them together would be perfect. Thank you. Now you all have some reading to do to keep up. Um, thank you so much. It was just fabulous. You cannot see. Oh, Alan is also suggesting the Times of Israel. I don't know if you have thoughts. Oh, on that. definitely. Yes, yes, yes. Definitely the Times of Israel. Uh, absolutely the Times of Israel. And also you can follow Tal, Tal Snyder. She's a journalist, a really good journalist. And she's, um, yeah, she's really good. And she also writes in English from time to time. So Wonderful. Well, I am just going to thank you so much on behalf of everybody who is still on the call. Um, we just so appreciated your spending time with us and sharing your vast knowledge on the subject. It was definitely enlightening um, and a, a pleasure to be here. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Have a great night. We hope to see you again. Take care.